First off, don't worry, man. I'm not a cop. I'd have to tell you if I was. It's the law. So what's the deal with YouTube hosts walking up to their chair lately at the last second like they didn't know their own show was about to start? I'm thinking of you there, Marquez. I mean, at least this is a live stream, or at least recorded live, so there'd be an excuse. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's garage, we'll be taking a look at something seemingly very simple. The old on-off switch. It seems so easy. It's off. It's on. It's off. It's on. One, zero. One, zero. Sadly, it's not that simple. In applications ranging from elevator buttons to launching a nuclear ICBM, you want to get it perfect every time. And that requires a process known as debouncing. We'll talk about what debouncing is, why it's needed, and how to do it. Once we understand it, we'll drop into the code editor, and I'll show you the debounce code for this set of emergency flashers, part of a sequential LED set of lights that I'm working on right now. You can see if I turn these off. Standard left turn, right turn, brakes, backup, all the features you would want. Okay, let's turn off the YMCA mode so we can talk about what it is that we're going to do today, which is we're going to debounce the switch. What does that mean and why is it needed? Well, let's take a very simple switch, a mechanical switch like this one, where when you press it, it's closed and should connect the two wires, posts, you know, whatever goes in one comes out the other, no resistance, they're connected, however you want to look at it. When it's open like this, nothing flows between the two poles. So what's tricky about this? Well, all it is, of course, is two metal things coming together somewhere. Bonk. But now, if you think about it, imagine this at the level of watching it with an electron microscope in slow motion. What you're going to see is that, first of all, the surface is not uniform at all. It's jagged, and it's going to come together somehow in a sort of an unpredictable way that might make contact and break contact and make contact and break contact, you know, in nanoseconds even, but it's still going to do it. And even a bigger effect is that when the switch closes, the contact is going to go boom, boom and then subtle. It's not going to slam shut one time perfectly. That's why in big heavy duty breakers, like in Jurassic Park, when you saw the girl pumping up the one breaker and then she fires it. All right, here I go, okay? One, two, three, four, okay. Long time ago, but I bet you remember that weird scene. The reason for that is because you want that breaker to fire with a great deal of force so that it mechanically contacts one time very firmly without bouncing back and re-arcing and doing all kinds of horrible stuff. Now, we're not concerned with things like the level of current in the Jurassic Park fence. We're going to be doing microcontroller pins. Uh, the voltage is 3.3 volts, milliamps, microamps, nanoamps, femtoamps. Well, not really, but it's going to be a small amount of power. What's going to happen is we're going to route power from the 3.3 volt leg of the chip to one side, and then from the other side of the chip to one of the input pins on the microcontroller. And we're gonna to wanna to know, is it off or on? And we wanna know, is it for real off or on? Imagine this is, because I can actually get the same switch in multiple different types, an on off clicky. So that each time you hit it, it changes state. Well, same problem. Even though you think, well now it's a firm contact, it's still got that problem of the irregular surface and the balance when it closes, and other things that cause it to open and close multiple times right at the time it's changing state. So what we're going to do is we're going to start and interrupt the moment we see it and every time we see a change in the state. So what's that going to do? We're going to come along, we're going to say the last change in state we saw was either off or on, whatever we saw, and when that happened. Next, we'll have code that says what's the current state of the actual pin and how long has it been that way and does it match what's going on in the one that was set by the interrupt. And if they stay the same for some amount of time, like 30 milliseconds, and we say, yeah, I guess it's actually for reals now. Uh, if it's gonna bounce, it's gonna do it in less than 30 milliseconds. So you probably go down to 10. You might be able to go down to one or five, but I'm not that picky. And I figured 10 milliseconds was a pretty good response time for a switch. That means you would have to manually activate it over 100 times a second to be faster than its response time. Okay, let's drop right into the code editor and have a look. So the file we're looking for is main. And the function we're going to start with is setup. That's where everything gets initialized and set up for the very first time. It's called once every time the chip starts up before the main loop is called. 
And the only parts we're concerned about are the input pins. And so this has four input pins, one for the left turn, one for the right turn, one for backup, and one for the emergency flashers. Brake is figured out from the state of the left and right turn pins because it has to work with some really old trailers and stuff like that. The next code of interest is this attach interrupt code. What it's going to do is attach an interrupt handler, in this case named the left turn IRQ, to a digital pin so that every time a change occurs, it's going to fire that interrupt. So we attach one for the left turn pin, one for the right turn pin, one for the backup pin, and one for the emergency pin. If you're curious, I'm using pins 36, 37, 38, and 39. Not the ones I would use if I built this circuit today because a lot of those are kind of specialized input pins, but it doesn't really matter if you're not gonna need them. So it, it works, but I'd probably go down to 16, 17, 18, 19, that area. The next piece of interesting code that we need to look at is the lighting event class. There's one of these for braking, there's one for left turn, there's one for right turn, there's one for backup, and there's one for emergency flashers. Each one does roughly the same thing. It tracks the state of its input pin to see when it should be on, but there are specialized cases. For example, the sequential taillight that goes left to right, or right to left, it actually completes its animation whenever you let go of the button. So if you're signaling and you turn the signal off, it still fades out, it doesn't just dink, turn off. As another example, brake immediately turns off. It does not animate out or do anything. So each one can be slightly different. They accomplish that different behavior by overriding base functions in the base class, which is lighting event. For example, normally there's a begin and an end member, which tells it to go active and stop being active. But because I want the emergency flashers to be an on off switch, I toggle it in the begin code. So you can override things and get your own custom behaviors. There is a second pin that you can define for a switch, and that way you've got to have both active at once, maybe as a backup or a safety. Uh, so imagine a nitrous setup, something like that. You want to make sure that both are active, not just arming and the carb switch. You want to make sure they're both active. When we come in here, this is the constructor, and you tell it what the light strip is and which button is going to fire off this feature. It simply records that information and starts off in the non-active state. This is the IRQ function. This is called for this button whenever the IRQ is fired for this switch. So that means when the user presses whatever switch is associated with button 36, if 36 is left turn, the left turn's IRQ object will be called. First thing it does is it grabs a critical section because we don't want to re-enter this code and it's possible that when this, as I mentioned before, the thing could be bouncing very quickly we don't want to be called and then called again and called again while we're still not even done the first call. If that happens, they will block at the entrance. That's what the uh, port mux critical interrupt service routine is. So no, it's not port. It's port enter critical section. Internet interrupt. <laughs> Internet. Uh, let me try one more time, please. Enter critical section for an interrupt service routine, I assume. So what we're going to do is we're going to record what's the new state, whatever the current state of the button is. Did it just turn on or did it just turn off? And we're going to save that as last IRQ button state. We're then going to get the time it occurred, and we're going to save that as the debounce timeout so we know when it happened. We're going to just increment the number of interrupts so we know that at least one happened with this value. We then exit the critical section, and that's all this code does. Now, all the interrupt section... Oh, all the interrupt handler does is to find out what button is being pressed, save that information, what time it happened, and get out. The less you do in an interrupt handler, the better. Next, let's have a look at check for button press. This function should be called periodically so that the code can pull the button's own state and keep track of state changes and react to such state changes. Some are virtual buttons. This gets a little more complicated, but as an example, the stop is not actually associated with a pin. You've got to have a left and a right, but there are, you can't just use the two pin version of it for other reasons. Um, so what happens is it is a button that's associated with no pin and its code still exists and does all of its stuff and runs the interrupt service routine. And we call its begin and end manually based on the state of the left and right pins because they both have to go active within a certain amount of time in order for them to be considered the same and that be therefore a break signal. We'll get there eventually, but for now all you need to know is that not every button object has a pin associated with it and the ones that don't just bail out of here right away. For the ones that do, we record the button state 
And we save away the number of interrupts that have occurred because we want to make sure it's more than zero. We want to save the debounce timeout of when it occurred and whatever the last button state was when the interrupt happened. You may be wondering why do I care about the number of interrupts and you just want to make sure it's happened more than zero times. Because you can imagine this code could be called before the interrupts ever fired. But that's this test. If you've never had an interrupt yet, don't treat it as anything. Otherwise, if the current state that we're seeing when we look at the button is the same as what the IRQ saved away, and currently the time is at least debounce time since that time was saved, then we're going to say, hey, something has happened. The button has changed state. It's either gone high or it's going to go on low. But whatever it's done, we're going to figure that out in the next piece of code. Once we fall through into here, we check to see, is this the case where the button is high being pressed? If so, if there's no other button associated with this, meaning it's not like an arming pin and requires a second button, or if that second button is satisfied, then we call begin. Otherwise, if it was already active, we call end. Why is that? Ah, so this is to make sure that in the cases where the button has gone high, but all the other conditions have not been met, we just call its end function to make sure it's not running. Now, in the other case where the button isn't high, but in fact the button is low, we check to see, were you already running? And if so, we call your end function. We zero the number of interrupts here so that that code block above won't run until the interrupt handler has incremented at least one time. I could have probably named it bool b has interrupt handler fired and just, you know what? That's not such a bad idea. Let's see if anybody ever looks at this. No, no, they don't. So we're going to say has has IRQ handler fired yet. And we're going to make it a bool. And we'll say false. Here where we were incrementing it before, we don't need to increment. We just need to know that, yeah, you've seen it. So we'll just set it to true. This becomes a boolean as well. And this becomes false. I'm so confident in this change that I don't need to run it. I'm kidding. Let's do it. Let's upload. Okay, it's uploaded. Let's test it. Left turn. Yes. Right turn. And what if I hold it? It works, and then let go, stops, stop works, emergency flashes work, and backup works. By the way, this is not a slow response. This is an animation I added. You might be wondering, why does it take so long to light all those LEDs? Well, it's intentional. You can see uh, stop happens pretty quick. That wasn't stop. And in fact, it will fill it in like a 50th of a second, so it's instant. Trust me, every delay you see is intentional. I then remove those delays later to support my reputation as a master optimizer. No, I'm kidding. All right, what else have we got here? That should be it for the switch. Now that we know roughly how switches work, let's take a look at the main loop in order to see how the process and display inputs function works. What it's going to do is it's going to call all of the objects, the left, right, stop, emergency, and backup objects, and give them all a chance to process their inputs because they do a lot of things in common, as we saw. In this code, if the left turn is active and the right turn is also active, and the left turn's total elapsed time active is less than 5 one hundredths, and the right turn has also been active for less than 5 one hundredths, we then turn off the signals and turn on braking. Because what's happening is, on the older trailer connectors, you really only had four pins. You had taillights, left, right, light, right, right. These were also used for signals. That's why it's bright and not turn necessarily because you lit them both for braking and all the car did was to light the right signal on the trailer connector and that would make the trailer lights light up but we need to deduce from that what's going on once you get up to like a seven pin trailer harness there is a stop line but we don't have that well even if we do i think my truck does have that now but we don't want to assume it it's only there i believe if you have an electronic brake controller which my truck does have but you can't assume it because not all vehicles have it. So I'm trying to make everything work here on a four pin. 
one of the other tricks of the older vehicles is that signal and braking can be active at the same time and all it does is wink off and on the one signal in the direction that you're going. So both brights will come on for the brakes and then the side you're turning at will just turn dim, bright, dim, bright, dim, bright. It's not real visible, but it works. Um, what we see here is code to check for this. If your braking is active and it, both the left and the right turn signals have gone inactive, then we end braking. That means you've released the brake that was causing both pins to be lit. But if only one of them goes inactive, that means you're braking and signaling at the same time, and so we have to handle that. What does that look like? Let's see if I can do that. Here's a stop. There you go, followed by a turn. Stop. Hazards. So it's, it handles all those combinations in this block of code. That's it for today. Thanks for joining me for this little tour of how the switches work. We'll take much more an in-depth look at this actual whole project if there's any interest in it. So if there is, let me know in the comments, share, make sure other people see it because then the views will go up and I'll say, hey, look at that. People actually care about LEDs. In the meantime and in between time, hope to see you next time right here in Dave's Garage. This little chair will be waiting for one of you, and a rocking chair for another who likes to rock, and a big armchair for two more to curl up in. All next time on Dave's Garage.